All right, let's get some words from the street of London. Our London correspondent, Juliana, will feed us in. Good morning, Juliana. Well, the traffic here in Lagos, particularly coming to this end where our office is, is horrible. Just wondering if you guys there in London are also experiencing this traffic. Uh, good morning, Timothy. Well, there is, it's rush hour in London. It's uh, 9.47 uh, here, and there is rush hour. But the, the difference, I suppose, in London is that there are options. You know, we've got the underground, the overground, um, and various other means of transport. Uh, so, yes, uh, apologies for that. That's the problem we have here. No other options to get to this place. Anyway, it's so sad to hear that UK has recorded the ninth case of coronavirus. How worried are you folks there? And uh, what is the government doing so far to contain the spread? Well, yeah, it, it is pretty worrying. I would say not just in the UK, but across the globe. Um, last night, I think uh, China recorded their deadliest uh, 24 hours with COVID-19, which is the official name of the coronavirus now. I think over 200 people um, died in Hubei province. So on one hand, I mean, on one day, it seems to be plateauing. Fast forward 24 hours, it gets worse. But yes, the, the ninth case of COVID-19 has um, been diagnosed in the UK. It's actually in London, which is particularly worrying because of course, this is a major city. Uh, what we are hearing uh, from officials is that a female uh, patient was traveling from China um, into a London airport. And it's when she came through the airport that the virus um, was uh, was diagnosed. She's now uh, being looked after at St. Guy's and Thomas's Hospital, which is literally just a stone's throw away from where I'm standing now. Um, so, you know, authorities are doing what they can. Um, 83 Brits who uh, were taken back from Wuhan province where uh, the virus um, was sus suspected to have started. They've been quarantined for two weeks, and that um, time is up now. Uh, so they'll be released um, from a centre in Merseyside, which is in Liverpool. Um, none of them have tested positive uh, for COVID-19. So authorities are saying they're doing what they can. And um, we did hear from Public Health England a couple of hours ago, and they said they suspect that more cases are likely uh, to arise in the UK, but it's the treatment, it's the quarantine and the treatment. And so long as uh, the UK and the British government have got that down, hopefully the spreading um, won't be too severe. Mm. All right, did you take a peep into the Downing Street this morning? What's the mood like as Prime Minister Boris Johnson gets set to make first major cabinet reshuffle since the general election victory? Well, it's certainly a big, big story, not necessarily for the British public, but definitely for the politicians. As you said, this is the first cabinet reshuffle that uh, Prime Minister Boris, Boris Johnson is making since his landslide election victory in December. I suppose the reason why there is such anxiety amongst his cabinet ministers is because he hasn't been prime minister for that long. He already had what he considered his Brexit team. He's 22 hard-line Brexiteers that were sitting around the table, and many of them would have thought that their jobs would be safe. But of course, now he's got such a, a huge um, a majority, he wants only the best around him. A um, couple of the headlines that are coming out of uh, the British press today is that uh, men in politics like the company of other men in politics. Um, and so far, Boris Johnson has seven uh, female cabinet ministers in very senior positions some of them being Theresa Villiers. She is the Environment Secretary at the moment. Another popular name um, in British politics is Andrea Leadsom, who's the head of the House of Commons and also the Business Secretary. There are rumours that they're certainly in for the chop um, and other female ministers too. So it's a fine balance. Um, Boris Johnson does like to be surrounded by the best, but they're hoping uh, there'll be enough female um, cabinet ministers. What we're expecting is that Dominic Raab, the Foreign Secretary, as well as Sajid Javid, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, or the Finance Minister, um, will keep their jobs. But about now, probably in about 10 or 15 minutes, we're likely to know who has been promoted and who has been demoted. Of course, let's keep our eyes on that. Now, a survey has showed that the cost of repairing the Elizabeth Tower, which houses the famous Big Ben Bell, has risen by 18.6 million pounds, that's a lot. How will this impact the government budget? 
Well, it's a lot of money, uh, Chimase, but they're certainly going to have to pay for it because, of course, Big Ben, you know, you can't come into London and not visit Big Ben. That's an iconic uh, building and it has so much importance. But there are some people that are saying that this is completely getting out of hand, but you can't really blame the government because this is more, um, th this is a cross-party, a cross-party uh, development. But, you know, the money is getting too much now um, it's risen to £80 million. That's exactly what it's going to cost. And what we've heard from the new speaker is that uh, contractors who went in a couple of years ago just had no idea what they were going to um, uh, have find. Um, apparently, there's a World War II bombing issue uh, that they face when they dug deep um, down into the centre of Big Ben and asbestos and other hazardous products. When... Uh, Big Ben was built hundreds of years ago. Uh, who knew that uh, the world would be moving on in an environmentally, environmentally friendly way that we have? So there's a lot of cleanup. That cleanup costs millions of pounds. Also, as well, contractors, their fees has risen by millions of pounds as well. And they can't just fix uh, the clock. It cannot be repaired. It actually has to be replaced. So there's lots of toing and throwing. But yes, it's been signed on the dotted line. So that 18 million pounds will already be added to the over £60 million um, that it's cost. And that is likely uh, to be fixed and ready to be bonging uh, by this time next year. Interesting. All right, let's drill down to the corporate news. New BP boss Bernard Looney says he wants the company to sharply cut net carbon emissions by 2050 or sooner. Any idea what strategies he hoped to achieve this week? Well, you know, this is, this is a huge announcement from BP. Uh, they're not the first uh, oil major to announce it. We've also heard similar uh, remarks by Royal Dutch, um, Shell and Total. But look, um, he was given a keynote speech yesterday in front of investors and journalists. And he said that, yes, BP must, within the next 30 years, um, be a net zero emissions um, oil major. And it's going to cost them trillions and trillions of pounds to try and use alternative ways to dig uh, for oil and gas. Um, so it seems as if a lot of the people that were in the room were um, understanding why BP wanted to do it um, and uh, when they want to do it. The issue that a lot of people are facing is how exactly are they going to do this? Bernard Looney, he is the new CEO, um, but in 30 years' time, it will be his uh, predecessors, his successors, um, that will be placing the weight on this. But, you know, it's, it's a good initiative. Of course, Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister, he says that he wants the UK to be uh, right front and centre in this fight against um, climate change. Of course, BP is in the dirty oil business, so it's the right time to say this, but it's just exactly how and when they'll be doing it. 30 years is a long time, but uh, also when Looney was giving that speech yesterday, he did say that, you know, BP will still be digging um, for oil and gas, so it's just how exactly they intend to do it over the next couple of decades. All right, Juliana, just before I let you go, did you see that headline by Nestle that it's taking out its low sugar chocolate due to weak sales? Does it affect you? Are you a chocolate lover? I'm sorry, Chimmy. I, I, I am a chocolate lover. I know you are too. I'm not. <laughs> and I'm sure a lot of our viewers are. But look, you know, these confectionery companies, they've been facing massive amounts of criticism from the public, particularly in the UK as it deals with uh, childhood obesity. So they've been under pressure to um, put out low sugar um, uh, chocolate and sweeties. And that's exactly what Nestle have done. They launched a couple of products um, a few months ago. And uh, today they announced that they'll be withdrawing those products because it just doesn't cut the mustard. When parents and children are going into the stores and they're seeing these products, they're just not attractive. Um, so they've decided to withdraw them. But they are looking at new technology, new ways, new flavors, so they can still um, combat uh, high sugar in these products. But they're going to have to be a lot more attractive, not just to the kids, but to people like us as well. Well, that's ironical, though, that Nestle is making weak sales in its low sugar chocolates because a lot of people are now health conscious and ordinarily will, of course, go for such if they must have chocolate. Well, I'm not a chocolate lover anyway. Thank you, Juliana. Enjoy the day. <laughs> well, that's a wrap on the program. Thank you for watching. I'm Chimeze Obi Iwago.